Well, we had a group process. Uh, there are certain guests who are obviously hot uh, in the guest market, and there is literally a market for that, as there is for rubber tires or toothpaste or anything else. If you've just hit the home run that won the World Series, 98 shows want you that night, you know, or, or the next weekend night. Uh, if you've just starred in the big movie of the year, there are many reasons why it's obvious that any particular performer or public figure, politician, whoever he is, would be a hot item on the guest market. Then there are there's another category of guests who may be never their entire lives hot in that first category way, but who uh, make great guests nevertheless for talk shows because they're they're valuable, they're articulate, and sometimes they're funny. Years before Burt Reynolds was known to the world, he just happened to come on as a guest. I have no idea who booked him. And he was marvelous. No matter what I said, he had something funny to say in response. Some hosts, I think, sometimes use their guests as straight men for their own jokes, planned or ad lib. Mm -hmm. But he was just terrific. I, I always much preferred if a guest, either a stranger in the audience or a star, would get his own laughs. I mean, I was there every night. I was in no hurry to get my next laugh. But if they give you something free and, and good, hooray for that. So he was an example of a guest I kept saying, book him, book Burt Reynolds again whenever he's available. Another very reliable guest back in the period of the 60s and 70s was uh, Charles Nelson Riley. He always came on like a bunch of firecrackers and uh, always had something funny to say and just had a funny attitude. So, and, and Jack Parr during his uh, five years uh, had those marvelous guests like Alexander King, thank you, mm -hmm. and Elsa Maxwell and, and some of the others, Oscar Levant and others. So there are some people who uh, any talk show host would want to have not only on, but back again often, uh, for obvious reasons. Almost every night, some talk show is turning down some guests. I've been turned down as a guest myself. It's not a disgrace. Uh, there could be many reasons for it. Uh, just recently, for example, uh, there was an attempt to book me recently. Now we're talking about December of 1997. I had just done an important uh, and fortunately successful comedy and music special for the PBS public stations. So uh, by the time somebody tried to get me a guest booking on The Tonight Show, which I created in the first place, uh, to promote that, uh, they said the answer was, oh, God, if we'd only heard about this last week, we would have been delighted to have him, but we don't have any openings in the next three or four nights. So there are reasons sometimes where you can't book a guest, even though he might want to be on or his studio might want him on. And yeah, again, to get back to my own shows, there were some times when we just didn't want one guest or another, and sometimes it's not so much a rejection as a matter of a preferred choice. If you have one opening on Wednesday night in the last half hour of the show, and you have a choice between Donald Duck and, and some unknown comic, you better take Donald Duck, you know. So there could be that kind of a reason why a given guest is not invited into the party on a given night. There were rare instances where... Uh, I turned down a guest, and by rare, I don't think it happened more than, oh, 10 times in all the, the, the 12 or 13 years I did talk show duty, where I just didn't think the guest was talented. <laughs> it sounded like a, heartful, a heartless thing to say, and I never said it to the guest, but we just somehow avoided booking him. Not the same guy in each case. There was one horrifying night uh, that your question, however, reminds me of. Uh, I was doing the second talk show series in the early 60s and there was a guy concerning whom some of our production crew, there are always five or six people participate in those decisions, yeah book him or no he's no good, don't book him and there had been a question as to whether we should book this guy, so we finally did no big deal and uh, so he was on stage doing his little five minute comedy turn and across the stage something was going on backstage, so only I could see it because I was on this side, and I wish I could remember what it was now, and I think I wanted them to cut the next number, whatever it was. So I'm signaling one of our production people, and I finally got his attention, and I'm going, no, no, don't do the thing with the wristwatch or whatever it was, and suddenly the man on stage looks over and sees me going, no, cut it. And he thinks, I'm sure he thought I was referring to him. And I wasn't. He wasn't in my mind at all. He was doing okay. But by the time the show was over, he was gone. So I, I never did get to explain it to the poor guy. Well, our regular singers, of course, always made a very important contribution. Steve Lawrence, Edie Gourmet, and Andy Williams. Sometimes people come up to me in airports or empty lots and say, who is that wonderful third, or the, the fourth singer? 
Uh, the reason I, I said third is because uh, the th number three has relevance. There were actually three uh, women who occupied that fourth singer spot. And the first is a, it's a very sad, but all too typical, I suppose, show business story. When The Tonight Show was starting, the local version of it, we held auditions. Uh, there were some singers I knew, but they were already sort of in the semi-star category, and I didn't think they'd want to be the girl singer every night. Perhaps they would have. Anyway, we held auditions, and a young woman, uh, we'll call her uh, Patty Smith, it's a, not, not her real name, she won the audition. She was cute looking, and she did a couple of cute little numbers, and lots of pep and swing, and a darling performance, so we hired her. So at the end of the first week, she was on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. At the end of the first week, Friday night, after her show, after our show, uh, Bill Harbeck, our producer, went up to her and he said, Hey, honey, thanks. You were great this night. What, what would you like to sing next Monday? She said, What? And he said, You know, for your number, what do you want to do for us next Monday? And she said, I don't know, which is, that scared him a little bit, that answer. And he said, What do you mean? And she said, Well, I only know the three numbers I did the one I did Monday, the one. <laughs> Wednesday and Friday. He said, well, okay, don't worry about that, but you, you'll have to, uh, Saturday, Sunday, you'll have three nights to learn another song. He said, oh, no, it takes me weeks to learn a song. Believe it or not, she had audition with the only three songs she knew, and she was not really musically gifted. She was just cute and vivacious, and she had a naturally pleasant sound. That was the end of the poor thing's career. Isn't that sad? And here she was on this show that was just about to take off like a rocket. She could have been a star, except for that bad break. Very sad. sad. Then uh, another, uh, the second uh, singer uh, is a much better position in the world uh, subsequently as Mrs. Larry Gelbart. Her name was Pat Marshall. She had worked as a young woman uh, in staff work at MGM in the movies and done some Broadway work, I believe. And she's a very fine singer. And to this day, I've never found out how suddenly she was not on our show anymore. Uh, if I ever do any more shows, well, in later years, nobody ever fired anybody without talking to me about it first, and there was very little firing. But uh, there were several instances, as I've indicated, where I showed up and was the last one to find out that singer number seven or producer number three was not with us anymore. Uh, maybe it's because I always kept such a light hand on the throttle, they thought they didn't have to ask me about a lot of stuff. But she was no longer with us, and then uh, she was replaced by a very talented uh, singer named Pat Kirby, who was with us, generally working in duets with uh, Andy Williams and also her own solo work for quite a long time. I think she was with us for a couple of years or so. They were all uh, marvelous. Th those are the, the, the four, the, as I mentioned with Pat Kirby, who were with us for the longest uh, period of time. Steve and Edie met uh, on the old uh, local version of The Tonight Show and then later were, of course, uh, married and have worked together ever since. Uh, they never knew each other then, obviously, before that point. Steve had come in at the same time that first singer I mentioned auditioned, and he won the, the boys' competition, so to speak, and he was really just a boy. I think he was 17 at the time. And he auditioned in a little white sailor suit. Why? I have no idea. He looked like he jumped off a Cracker Jack box. I don't think he was ever in the Navy. It was a costume, but it looked cute. And he had his little white sailor hat on the back of his head, and he looked like little blue, you know, blue-eyed, golden-haired Mr. America. And he sang very well. He always sang well, so he got the job. Then uh, E.D. I just happened to meet later up at Coral Records, a fellow named Bob Thiel, who said, I like you to meet a very fine young singer, so I met her. She said, great, come on over. So we hired her. Uh, it was Bill Harbeck, I'm pretty sure, who brought Andy Williams into the picture after we went on the network. That was a new addition. We had a little more money to spend. And he had known, I think, Andy uh, through Kay Thompson, who was the marvelous director of musicals and, and musical numbers at MGM, a member of their creative team, very creative team. And Andy was then known chiefly as just one of the Williams brothers. He was one of the singers with his brother. And I remember my first reaction to him, I thought, this guy has a great voice, I love everything about him, and I love his musical taste, because he sang nothing but the classiest, Cole Porter, Noel, whatever it was classy, Broadway, whatever it was, he, he did this material. And I remember thinking, what a pity he'll never become a star, because he's too good. His voice is too beautiful, he has such great taste. The reason you might think, why would you think somebody that good would not make it? It's because we had gotten into the period of rock and Elvis, and singers whose words you couldn't even understand. Sometimes, thank God, you couldn't. And I just saw music going into a cultural pipe of some kind, which would, of course, automatically exclude Andy. So I was so thrilled when, despite my dire predictions, he became a major star, 
and enjoyed many years of, of success. Pat Kirby was uh, probably the most beautiful of the, the four of them and probably knew more about music uh, than the other three too. She uh, did know music. She played the piano and she sang and she, she read music. I don't think the other actually could read it, although Andy might have been able to. But uh, they were a, a terrific group. Uh, no other talk show ever had that element to it since then. Uh, and uh, all of them have, have done very well and had good luck.